is maybe he's looking at the Secretary of State position. That's huge, right? That is so. big news. Yeah. And honestly, a credit to Donald Trump because Mitt Romney savaged him in that GOP primary. And so one of the main questions here, and obviously we're very interested to see whether Mitt Romney is going to be the Secretary of State, but one of the main questions as soon as Trump got elected was, what, is he going to change his stripes at all? Is he going to do anything to reach out to you know, people in the Republican Party with whom he hasn't gotten along or certain groups? And this, I think, says yes. Yes, he is, because as far as I know, they didn't have a makeup session, you know, that they still don't like each other. So one of his first moves is to bring in an establishment Republican who doesn't like Donald Trump. And if he winds up offering him a position like this, I mean, it would say a lot. So I want to know what the thinking is behind Kellyanne Conway's cryptic tweets and about the Secretary of State position, uh, the potential nomination of Mitt Romney. And then we have Mike Huckabee saying that Romney should make a public repudiation or at least an apology of his attacks on Trump before being offered the job. Does that track with uh, what you're hearing about the transition team's it, thinking? It does. A new piece of information I'm hearing tonight from a Trump transition official uh, is that there has been a conversation going on in private, very quiet, of course, about whether or not Mitt Romney should issue some sort of formal or informal apology to President-elect Donald Trump. Does he write a letter? Does he put out a statement of some kind? Because uh, in the words of Mike Huckabee, as you said, he has pointed out on Fox uh, that Mitt Romney didn't just go after uh, Donald Trump's policies. He went after his character. These, these were direct attacks calling him a fraud, for example, and a phony. Uh, and so if he were to be nominated as Secretary of State, it seems like that's business that needs to be cleaned up. And so from what I'm hearing from this official inside the transition about a possible, and I underline the word possible apology uh, from Romney, that tells us, it gives us a clue that Romney may be a much more serious contender for Secretary of State than a lot of people assumed at the beginning. Because of course, uh, if he was not a serious candidate, and there are other names out there, Rudy Giuliani, uh, David Petraeus, uh, Romney wouldn't even be considering an apology. It wouldn't even be broached by anybody uh, unless maybe he really wants this job. Joining us right now is former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee. Governor Huckabee, good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Happy Thanksgiving. So Thank happy you. Happy Thanksgiving to you. So this is a big debate that we're having this morning. Look, a lot of the Twitter followers are mad as hell about Romney. What's your take on Romney's chances over Rudy Giuliani, even over David Petraeus? Give us your sense. Well, you know, if, if Donald Trump is asking me for his advice, and he's not on this particular position, but here's what it would be. You should do everything you can to give Mitt Romney a job, just as he did everything he could to give you one. Ooh. So you figure how that works out. I get it. Yeah, Look, there you go. One of the most important things, well, you've got to surround yourself with people mm. like Secret Service people who will take a bullet for you rather than pull a bullet in you. Uh, that's not who you surround yourself with. Uh, the Secret Service people, for example, they'll give the president the best advice they have and say, I don't think you should go there, I don't think you should do this, but ultimately they recognize it's his decision. That's how you surround yourself with people who will be honest, who will even disagree, mm. but once the decision is made, they keep those disagreements behind closed doors. They don't go to a microphone, hold a news conference, and tell everybody uh, that you're not fit for the job. Look, he was really rude to Donald Trump. Let's let's be honest, panel, right here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. He called him a fraud. He said, you know, the only thing that is more of a fraud than Donald Trump is uh, a degree from Donald Trump University. Well, Governor, Governor, whose idea is this then? Because you don't seem on board with it. Newt Gingrich most definitely doesn't seem on board well, with I think it. Giuliani. So where did what? the idea come that, from? You, you mean, Dagan, you sense that I was not 100% behind this? Are you kidding me? Yeah. No, look, let me... <laughs> no, seriously, who, whose idea is that from? We want to know. Well, you know, the only thing that would surprise me more than Donald Trump offering the position would be that Mitt Romney would take it. And if he does, then I'd have to question, why would he do it? Because, I mean, if you don't believe that the person who has offered you a position is a person that you can trust, you think he's a fraud, a con man, uh, a phony, I mean, all the things that he was called and didn't take the job, then you have to think, boy, his ambition is so great that he would take a position from someone in, for whom he holds utter contempt. I, j I just can't imagine that well, that makes any a, sense. Th this is a different you. I, I'm seeing, because you are very, uh, you're a pragmatic man, but very loyal to Donald Trump. And you are, yeah. uh, you are publicly questioning this He's idea. Honest. He's being honest. 
Mm. Well, but, but here's the thing. I don't know that Donald Trump is about to launch it. I'm speaking now as objectively as I can from mm -hmm. the standpoint of somebody who appointed thousands of people over the course of my career, and, and I understand what that means. I know that personnel is policy. When you put people in jobs, you just put your policy in place, whether you know it or not. You may announce a policy, but if people are not with you, don't have your worldview, you don't want to surround yourself with yes men. Mm. You want to make sure that you've got people who will argue their points and disagree with you and well, do it vociferously, but behind closed doors. And when you make the decision, they stand, they salute, and if they absolutely morally can't go with you, then they have the good sense to resign and, and, and quietly go away. That's what you do. You give two things to a president. You give him your loyalty and you give him your confidentiality. Is there, is there, any, you don't have to that is there anything drop. about Mitt Romney and his resume that makes him a good candidate? I mean, like there are a lot of really smart, you know, people that could be Secretary of State. What's so special about Mitt Romney in that role? I mean, I don't know. There's yeah. not any diplomatic experience. It's not like exactly. he's been an ambassador. So that's what I'm saying. Uh, what you really want in the Secretary of State is somebody who does share your worldview, your vision of foreign policy, your understanding of the world, where its dangers are. I'm, uh, I'm not here to announce my candidacy for office, and I'm not going to endorse a candidate today. Instead, I'd like to offer my perspective on the nominating process of my party. Back in 1964, uh, just days before the presidential election, which incidentally we lost, Ronald Reagan went on national t uh, television and uh, challenged America, saying that it was a time for choosing. He saw two paths for America, one that embraced conservative principles dedicated to lifting people out of poverty and helping create opportunity for all, and the other, an oppressive government that would lead America down a darker less free path. I'm no Ronald Reagan, and this is a different moment in time. But I believe with all my heart and soul that we face another time for choosing, one that'll have profound consequences for the Republican Party, and more importantly, for our country. If we make improvident choices, the bright horizon I've described will not materialize. And let me put it very plainly. If we Republicans choose Donald Trump as our nominee, the prospects for a safe and prosperous future are greatly diminished. Let me explain why I say that. First on the economy. If Donald Trump's plans were ever implemented, the country would sink into prolonged recession. A few examples. His proposed 35% tariff-like penalties would instigate a trade war, and that would raise prices for consumers kill our export jobs, and lead entrepreneurs and businesses of all stripes to flee America. His tax plan, in combination with his refusal to reform entitlements and to honestly address spending, would balloon the deficit and the national debt. So even though Donald Trump has offered very few specific economic plans, what little he has said is enough to know that he would be very bad for American workers and for American families. But you say, wait, 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 isn't he a huge business success? Doesn't he know what he's talking about? No, he isn't. And no, he doesn't. <laughs> his, uh... Look, his, his bankruptcies have crushed small businesses and the men and women who work for them. He inherited his business. He didn't create it. And whatever happened to Trump Airlines? How about Trump University? And then there's Trump Magazine, and Trump Vodka, and Trump Steaks, and Trump Mortgage. A business genius he is not. Now Donald Trump tells us that he is very, very smart. <laughs> I'm afraid that when it comes to foreign policy, he is very, very not smart. Now, I'm far from the first to conclude that Donald Trump lacks the temperament to be president. After all, this is an individual who mocked a disabled reporter, who attributed a reporter's questions to her menstrual cycle, who mocked a brilliant rival who happened to be a woman due to her appearance, who bragged about his marital affairs, and who laces his public speeches with vulgarity. Donald Trump says he admires Vladimir Putin, 
At the same time, he's called George W. Bush a liar. That is a twisted example of evil trumping good. He said he saw thousands of Muslims in New Jersey celebrating 9-11. Wrong. He saw no such thing. He imagined it. He's not of the temperament of the kind of stable, thoughtful person we need as leader. His imagination must not be married to real power. Think of Donald Trump's personal qualities. The bullying, the greed, the showing off, the misogyny, the absurd third grade theatrics. You know, we've long referred to him as the Donald. He's the only person in the entire country to whom we have added an article before his name. And it wasn't because he had attributes we admired. <laughs> now imagine your children and your grandchildren acting the way he does. Would you welcome that? Haven't we seen before what happens when people in prominent positions fail the basic responsibility of honorable conduct? We have. And it always injures our families and our country. Watch, by the way, how he responds to my speech today. <laughs> Hillary Clinton's watch, the State Department, when she was guiding it and part of the Obama administration, that State Department watched as America's interests were diminished at every corner of the world. She compromised our national secrets. She dissembled to the families of the slain. And she jettisoned her most profound beliefs to gain presidential power. For the last three decades, the Clintons have lived at the intersection of money and politics, trading their political influence to enrich their personal finances. They embody the term crony capitalism. It disgusts the American people and causes them to lose faith in our political process. A person so untrustworthy and dishonest as Hillary Clinton must not become president. Of course, a Trump nomination enables her victory. And the audio and video of the infamous Tapper-Trump exchange on the Ku Klux Klan will play a hundred thousand times on cable and who knows how many million times on social media. There are a number of people who claim that Mr. Trump is a con man, a fake. Our presidents, time and again, have called on us to rise to the occasion. John F. Kennedy asked us to consider what we could do for our country. Lincoln drew upon the better angels of our nature to save the Union. I understand the anger Americans feel today. In the past, our presidents have channeled that anger and forged it into resolve, into endurance and high purpose, and into the will to defeat the enemies of freedom. Our anger was transformed into energy directed for good. Mr. Trump is directing our anger for less than noble purposes. Here's what I know. Donald Trump is a phony, a fraud. His promises are as worthless as a degree from Trump University. He's playing the members of the American public for suckers. He gets a free ride to the White House, and all we get is a lousy hat. <laughs> His domestic policies would lead to recession. His foreign policies would make America and the world less safe. He has neither the temperament nor the judgment to be president. And his personal qualities would mean that America would cease to be a shining city on a hill. I'm convinced America has greatness ahead. And this is a time for choosing. God bless us to choose a nominee who will make that vision a reality. Thank you, and God bless you all. So what do you think of the idea of Mitt Romney going to the State Department? Well, I, I mean, I, I would be concerned, one, I think uh, the vast majority of Trump's supporters uh, will initially be very unhappy and will be reminded of all the things that Romney said yeah. over the year. And two, because Romney does represent a very different viewpoint, I mean, uh, and authentically. Uh, I'm not sure whose Secretary of State he would be. And I think that's something what, that What Trump, do you mean by that? Well, I think Trump would have to really think through. Romney wanted to be in President-elect Trump's job, <laughs> yeah. you know, and 
to what degree would Romney, once he became Secretary of State, represent himself going around the world? I mean, being sort of in the John Kerry tradition right. of let's go to, from five-star hotel to five-star hotel, having nice gourmet dinners with foreign ministers. And to what extent would he actually represent the kind of tough-minded America first policies that Trump has campaigned on? I mean, Trump's got to have somebody at state who's very tough and very willing to take on foreign leaders and say, wait a second, I'm, I'm here to represent the United States of America. So you're saying the ideological, if, if I'm hearing you right, the ideological gulf between Trump and Romney is just too wide, maybe. Well, no, I mean, I mean look, they apparently had a very good meeting uh, on Saturday. It lasted several hours. And I've told uh, the, the uh, president-elect uh, that if he picks Romney, I'm going to support him. I mean, yeah. per, per, you know, President-elect Trump deserves to have the kid, the team he wants. That's his gamble. Uh, but I think he has to really have a very deep understanding. And there, I can think of 20 other people who would be more naturally compatible with the Trump vision of foreign policy. Right. Megan, the president-elect picked a place just a few blocks away from here for his big dinner with Mitt Romney. It's the French restaurant Jean George's, which is inside another Trump property and which has three Michelin stars, which means that it's just about as fancy a restaurant there is in New York City or anywhere on planet Earth. Even though Jean George's is surrounded by Secret Service right now, we have seen some pictures trickling out from the inside, and they show Trump holding court, saying something, while Mitt Romney and incoming White House Chief of Staff ranks Priebus listen intently. Priebus, who you see sitting there, is the only person from Trump's inner circle to publicly defend Mitt Romney over the last few days and talk about the benefits he could bring to the cabinet room or the State Department as longer-term Trump staffers have torched the 2012 nominee for being disloyal during the primaries. Our next guest warns that a secretary, Romney, would leave Mr. Trump's supporters feeling betrayed, suggesting in a Fox op-ed today on foxnews.com, quote, President-elect Trump should get up every day and begin by looking at his own campaign promises. He owes his presidency to the people who believed in him, not to the courtiers and schmoozers who had contempt for him as a candidate, but adore him now that he's going to be president. Newt Gingrich is a former House Speaker and author of the book Treason. Mr. Speaker, good to see you tonight. So mm -hmm. you called this potential appointment as uh, Mitt Romney as Secretary of State uh, a huge mistake and even outrageous. To those who say, all right, you know, Donald Trump knows what he's doing. This could be a counterbalance to some of the more, you know, hardliners in the administration he's creating. How do you justify those comments? As long as we're discussing the possibility, uh, I think it's a disaster. I think, first of all, uh, Romney's not like uh, the team of rivals around Abraham Lincoln. None of the team of rivals opposed Lincoln in the general election. Romney fought against Trump every single step of the way and fought against him with really vicious language. I mean, if you look at the things that Romney said about Trump, you'd have to say to yourself, uh, I don't care how good a schmoozer he is, uh, why would you believe him? I mean, if he comes in now and says, you know, all those mean, vicious things I said about you, I didn't really mean it, uh, give me a break. Uh, again, this is not well, the but, same as somebody who's a competitor. Let me challenge you on this. Sure. Even Kellyanne Conway said some very vicious things about Donald Trump. You know, maybe very <clears> vicious is too stretched, too much of a stretch, but she, she attacked him because she was, she was a Ted Cruz supporter. Of course. You know, that kind of thing tends to happen. And then they're both Republicans. They come together after the election. Mitt Romney and Donald Trump, reportedly, Donald Trump had a lot of respect for the way Mitt Romney ran Bain Capital. 
and and Mitt Romney and and Donald Trump have a mutual friend who tried to broker this alliance, according to a very interesting report today in in the Washington Post. So can't that happen? Okay, look, sure. Look, I, I have no doubt. For example, that Speaker Paul Ryan very much favors Mitt Romney. Romney picked him to be the vice presidential candidate. They are very close personally. Uh, Ryan's Priebus, who was a great National Committee chairman, uh, is very, very close to Ryan and was National Committee chairman during a period when uh, Romney was the, the nominee. So uh, there are a lot of different uh, things going on here. I'm only suggesting that when you have potentially a Rudy Giuliani, uh, you have an Ambassador Bolton, you have a wide range of people you could reach out to to decide that the person, and, and, and if you go back and you play the tone, the hostility, the contempt mm -hmm. uh, of the Romney speeches, and these were whole speeches. These no, you're weren't, right. You know, uh, it's pretty that hard to imagine. That is true. He went after Trump well, harder than anybody. Well, you have to say yourself, why would Trump believe that Romney's going to be Trump's Secretary of State? I know he wants to be Secretary of State, but my hunch is he'll turn out to be Romney's Secretary of State. Hmm. So we're going to see, because this is their second we meeting, and we're told that uh, <laughs> their wives also met tonight. I want to ask you, though, because you had some... You had a couple, first about this, this critique you had for the president-elect, and then I want to talk to you about the advice you had for him in his column. The first thing you said that was his biggest misstep in the three weeks since he won was that post on Twitter about widespread spread voter fraud in this election. Sure. Why was that so bad, where he asserted that he would have won the popular well, vote had it not been for allegedly a couple million illegal votes? Well, first of all, there's absolutely no proof that there were a couple million illegal votes. Second, there's a new standard now. He's about to be... President of the United States, really the leader in many ways of the entire planet, the most powerful country in the world, uh, and there's a standard of calm, accurate, clear. Now, I'm for him tweeting. I think, his, I think tweeting is very effective for him. I think it's a big part of who he is. But I really do think he needs an editor. And occasionally somebody needs to say to him, oh, maybe not this one. Uh, and I just thought that that was, it's, it's not that one tweet, but it's what it signals about the lack of self-discipline uh, and the lack of focus uh, that I think as president he has got to acquire uh, because the world has to have a sense of reliability that when Donald Trump speaks that there's a certainty and an accuracy that they can count on every single day 365 days a year uh, and that's a big challenge. Right, the gravity of that office uh, requires, you know, a, a Right. It's, it, it comes with a lot of responsibility. Let me ask you this. So you've been there. I mean, you, you, know, you, were, part, you were the head of the contract with America uh, when, when the Republicans took over the House in 1994. And so you, you've seen a president come into office and, and govern and reach across the aisle and get things done. Uh, and you were part of that. You're ta you talk about in this Fox News piece that reasonableness will be the death of Trumpism. Reasonableness. Explain sure. what you mean by that. Look, Washington has a whole range of reasonable things. Uh, the culture of the Foreign Service is a disaster. The reasonable people know you can't really fix it. The Civil Service and the Veterans Administration is corrupt, is filled with people who don't do their jobs, is filled in some cases with people who, who literally have criminal records, but reasonable people know you can't really reform the Civil Service. You go down this list, you know, we know the Congressional Budget Office is a joke, its estimates are a total disaster, it was totally wrong about Obamacare, but reasonable people know you have to use it because it's the only thing we have even if it's totally wrong. You just go down this list of reasonables and every reasonable statement moves you to selling out and keeping the swamp full. It doesn't drain the swamp, it keeps it full. When I became speaker, I sort of shocked the city because in my first speech at the Heritage Foundation on the Friday after the election, I said, you know, that, that I, I will cooperate, but I will not compromise. I had been elected to do the things in the contract with America. I had been elected to balance the budget. I had been elected to reform welfare. And I'd cooperate to get it done, and I think Bill Clinton and I did a pretty good job. But I wasn't going to compromise on our goals. Well, you know, Donald Trump has a contract with the American voter, which he outlined, I think, brilliantly at, at Gettysburg. He has the vision of a uh, New Deal for African Americans, which he outlined in Charlotte. If he's going to get those things done, he's going to have to be unreasonable with a city which is a swamp because the swamp doesn't want to be drained. I mean, nobody in Washington is running around saying, oh, please come in here and change everything. They're saying, how do we slow him down? You know, in the Pentagon, the term for the political appointees is the summer help. Uh, how do we outlast them? Oh, the summer help wants to do something. Well, they'll be gone soon. And that mm -hmm. kind of slow right. walking's true across the whole city. 
Speaker Gingrich, great to see you. Thanks for being here. Good to be with you. Thank you.